My name is Nikki. I'm the Community Education Coordinator here at the North Carolina Zoo and thank you for joining us today for our Animal Stars program. So just some to, some to go over what's going to happen today. So if you have any questions, make sure you ask those in the Q&A box, the question and answer box. And I'm going to be asking you guys a lot of questions. So if you have a response, put those in the chat box and that way Leslie can see those and she can feedback to me what you guys are saying out there. And Leslie's the one behind the camera running everything. So yeah, we can say a virtual hi to her. So the program today is called Animal Stars. And I have a really cool part of my job is I get to create programs for libraries in the summer. Because the libraries, they don't want your brains to go to mush during the summer. So they create this really cool program, the summer reading program to get you excited about reading and keep your brain active throughout the summer. Because you do need to exercise your brain too. And so they have these themes, these really cool themes that they come up with to get you guys excited about reading. And last year it was space, a universe of stories. And so I have to somehow create a program about space. I don't know if you guys know this, but I work at, I work at a zoo. <laughs> I'm like, um, there aren't very many animals in space. Can you guys think of any animals that live in space? Anyone? Yeah, anybody? Let me think of one. Bear. A bear? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're, you're kind of on the right track. I see where you're going. So there aren't any animals that we know of that we know for sure that live in space. There have been animals that have been in space. Fun fact, guys. So there was our, the first chimp that ever went into space. His name was Ham. He actually retired here at the zoo and spent the last years of his life here at the zoo having getting a chance to live with other chimps and be a chimp, which is pretty cool, right? So that's not going to create an hour long program <laughs> talking about him. So there are other things that we can talk about. So then I looked up to the skies and I saw those beautiful twinkling things up there, the stars, right? How many of you guys like looking at the stars? I know I do. I love to look up on a nice clear night and see all those beautiful stars. So when you look up at the stars, sometimes you can see shapes or pictures up there. Does anybody know what those are called? When you make a picture out of the stars, it begins with a C. We have, have a big word. oh yeah, Mary Constellation. Nice job. Automatic, Rachel Tucker. Nice. Chrissy. Oh, Stuart. Donahue, Grayson, Logan. Oh my gosh, so many. Great job. <laughs> you guys are so <laughs> smart. Nice. Constellations, absolutely. And those are up in the sky. And there's lots of cool different. So there's about 88 official constellations. And you know what? 42 of those are animals. Yes. That means I have a program now. <laughs> so I can talk about animals up in the stars. So there's lots of different, those 42 animal constellations. Now we're not gonna do all of them, trust me. We're only gonna hit a couple of them because we'd be here all day. So uh, let's see, where was I going with that? <laughs> so constellations. So stars create those stories, but what other way do stars help us? Does anybody know any way that stars have helped us in the past? Think way back before we had computers and phones. Uh, Maddox says travel. We travel. have navigation to find navigation. places. Oh wow, so many answers. Great nice. Job, yeah, absolutely. Navigation. So if Miss oh, Beth. Time. We had some say time. time. Oh, we're getting nice. So Beth will show our first picture. She's going to show a picture of a constellation that we're probably all very familiar with. Let's see if it'll come up. <laughs> There, it's coming. It's gonna. There we go. We got it. So, navigation was a big one. So, the big one. I'm gonna see that star right in the middle of your screen, called the North Star. It stays in the same spot all year round, and so that helps people to figure out where to go. So, if they can find the North Star, they know where North is. And if you know where North is, you're gonna find you know where South, East, and West are. So, it helps them to find their way around. And somebody said time. If you look at that, the big dipper there that we're looking at, it looks different at different times of the year. So it looks different in the summer and it's in different position in the winter, the fall and the spring. So it's kind of like a calendar. So you could tell, so a lot of people can look up to the stars and go, oh, 
the Big Dipper's in that position, oh, it's time to plant my crops or it's time to harvest my crops like that. So it was like a calendar form. So stars help them out. Did you have a question, Leslie? Oh, it got answered. Sorry. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So yeah, so finding our way around and even animals do that too. They, a lot of animals use the stars to find their way around and navigate. Any other ways they help us you can think of? I kind of mentioned it a little bit. All right, Miss Beth, we can come back to me. <laughs> Uh, Leslie says they help us with light to see. Absolutely right. So if you've ever been out in this out at night when that was clear and the cloudy and there were no stars or moon to be able to see, it's really dark. Whereas in the night when it's there's the moon and the stars you can see, it's much brighter. So right, they give us light. Absolutely. Now I was talking about those constellations. So hard to imagine. I know it's kind of hard to even think about this, but think back to a time before you had. You said we had the phones, you didn't have a phone, a computer, an Xbox, a PlayStation, whatever, Instagram, Snap, whatever, all that stuff you did. There wasn't even electricity. They didn't have books. So way back then, how did people entertain themselves? So because Chrissy, everybody wants to be entertained. Chrissy says stories and myths. Nice job. Absolutely. Stories and myths, right? They sat around the fire at night and told stories and made up stories and created all these really cool stories to keep themselves entertained. Absolutely. And that's what this program's about. We're going to meet some different constellations or some different stories from cultures all around the world because a lot of different cultures all over created these really cool stories. And we're going to start with some of our Native American stories. So Native Americans many years ago looked up to the sky and they created stories. And what's kind of cool, if Beth, you can show our next picture. They actually, if you think a lot of other constellations were created by the Greeks, which were on the other side of the world. And if you look at this picture, so those bright colorful pictures are the Native American ones. The ones kind of in the background, those lighter white ones, those are the current modern constellations. And they're somewhat similar. It's kind of cool that some of them that were created hundreds of years ago are still today. So kind of neat to think about. And so our first story goes with a Native American and it's with our, probably everybody's favorite animal. <laughs> Who here likes spiders? Let me know if you like a spider. <laughs> Yeah. So before we get started, I did have a quick question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wanted us to answer. Okay. Um, Holden asked, did Native Americans have animal friends? Uh, I don't know. They probably did have probably dogs or something, possibly that you're talking about, as mm -hmm. that helped them out. That's where a lot of our animals and, and I think even some horses possibly they used stuff mm -hmm. like that. So they probably did. But they Native Americans really revered animals and they respected them and they even respected spiders. <laughs> which is kind of cool. So spiders are part of our next story, our first story, I should say. And this is the Cherokee Native American tribes. So let me get my friends. I need some tools to help me out. So many, many years ago, back way, way, way back in time, when time began, it was dark. There was no light whatsoever. And all the people and the animals were walking around, running into each other, and they couldn't see anything. It was so dark. Well, Mr. Fox, he got fed up with this. And he said, I can't take this anymore. He said, I heard a rumor that there were other people on the other side of the world that had light and they weren't sharing it. They were hoarding it, kind of like toilet paper nowadays. <laughs> so they were hoarding all the light and they were keeping it to themselves and they weren't sharing with the people and the animals on the other side of the world. So Mr. Possum, Oh, possum, I should say. Sorry, Leslie. <laughs> he said, well, that's not fair. I'm going to do something about it. He said, I'm going to go to the other side of the world and I'm going to get some of that sunlight. And so he walked to the other side of the world. And when he got there, it was this big, beautiful tree. And hanging off it was this beautiful ball of light, the sun. And Mr. Possum was like, oh, my goodness, I am going to go get some. And he climbed that tree and he went up to the sun and he took his furry tail and he grabbed the sun and he wrapped it in his tail. And as he was walking down the tree, he went 
what's that smell? Something smells, smells like something burning. What is it? You look back and his tail was on fire and it burnt all the hair off his poor tail. And of course he dropped the sun because it was hot. And so that's why opossums don't have hair on their tails. Oh, the poor possum. So he had to go back to the other side and tell his friends that he had failed. And now he has a naked tail. Poor possum. Well, Mr. Vulture, he stepped up and he said, well, I'm gonna do something about that. I can figure this out. And so he flew to the other side of the world and he found that tree. And he said, and he went up to the sun, he says, I'm gonna be smarter than a possum. I'm not gonna put it on my tail because I don't want to burn my beautiful tail. I'm gonna put it on the, my head where I have a whole bunch of thick feathers and they'll protect my head. So he picked up the sun and he placed it on his head. And as he was flying off, he went, uh-oh, oh, something's burning. Oh my God, oh my God, my head's on fire. So he dropped the sun, oh no. And he lost all the feathers on his head. And that's why poor vultures have bald heads now. Oh no. So he had to fly back to the other side of the world and tell all his friends that he failed. He's like, oh no. Well, sitting on the sidelines, Miss Grandmother Spider, she was hanging out watching all this happening and she, she was pretty smart. She was very wise and she put up her legs <laughs> and said, I got this guys, I can take care of this. So she went over and she created a bowl made out of clay because the smart girl that she was, she knew that clay could withstand heat, could take a really high heat. So she spun a web that went clear across the sky to the other side of the world. And she climbed across the web and she found that tree. And then she talked to the people there and she said, I'm gonna take the sun for half a day. And I'm gonna, when I go, and I'm gonna leave my web up in the sky and it's gonna become the Milky Way and it's gonna be bright and sparkly and you'll be able to see in the dark. Well, I'm gone with the sun and then I'll return it in 12 days, in 12 hours. And we'll do this so we can share the sun and you won't be completely in the dark and we won't be completely in the dark and we'll have those stars to help us see at night. So she was able to bring the sun over to the other side of the world and they were able to share the sun and they had daylight and nighttime. Spider's pretty awesome, right? <laughs> Who would have thought? Now, I don't know that Gwen, our first friend, is gonna be able to uh, make us web big enough to go across the sky, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll meet her, and she's, and now you notice I'm putting gloves on. It's not really for my protection, a little bit, but more for hers. Especially nowadays that we're all using hand sanitizer and soap on our hands. I have a lot of chemicals probably on my hand, and I don't want those chemicals to hurt. Our next friend is Gwen. I'm gonna very gently. Uh, so we had a question real quick while you're yeah. getting Gwen out. Okay. Um, Finn Chaser, or Finch, Finn Chaser, that's what I'm gonna go with. <laughs> Sorry if I butchered that. It says, are some planets stars? So no, planets are planets. So stars are basically just balls of gas, kind of out there. It's kind of like our sun is actually a star. So yeah, so good questions, guys. And I so, might add to that, sometimes we, when we look up at this, the sky, we say, oh, look at all these stars, but they some might truly planets. be planets. Yep, yeah, absolutely. They're a little bit different. So, but you can still, sometimes you can see this with like Venus and, and uh, uh, Mars, sometimes you can see, absolutely. So let's see, I'm going to get a little bit closer. All right, we got a spider coming at you. What do you guys think? So this is Gwen. She might not be quite as wise as Grandmother Spider, but she's still pretty awesome. And she is a Chilean rose tarantula. And she gets that because she's got those beautiful kind of rose hairs up on her upper part of her body. Yes, we have a question. Um, as you're saying that too, yeah, Isabel wanted to know why she's furry. Oh, very good question. Right, so she does have a lot of hair on her body and some of those are kind of help her to feel around. But now I said, I put the gloves on to protect her, but they're also gonna kind of protect me in a little ways too, because one, <laughs> she is, sorry, she's very active today. So she, when she, one way she protects herself 
is she's got these hairs on the back of her body. I don't know if you guys can see those on her abdomen, that's called. And when something goes to eat her, she will kick those hairs off. Now think of this, guys. If you were gonna go take a bite out of a burger and all of a sudden it started shooting hairs, little tiny little pokey little hairs into your mouth, into your nose, into your eyes, are you gonna wanna eat that burger anymore? Cause I don't know if you've ever gotten like sand in your eye, it hurts, right? It's hurt, so it's a pretty good way of defending yourself. So she shoots those off into whatever wants to eat her mouth and they're all of a sudden they have a mouthful of these spiky little hairs and they don't want to eat her. So that's why some of those hairs are there to protect her. And that's why I'm wearing the gloves. So she doesn't, there's a special fun science word called eradicating ur hairs. <laughs> yes. Uh, to go with that, when we were talking about Stella wanted to know what does she eat? Oh, very good question. Well, she is a spider or an arachnid and she's actually got a pretty cool job in the world. She's kind of a pest controller. And so she actually eats other insects. Well, she eats insects. And so she can eat all kinds of variety of insects. We feed her crickets. And you guys wanna hear the gross story? How they eat their food. So spiders are venomous and they have these big things that they can inject the venom into their food. And venom is basically, it's special spit. It's just saliva that has been modified. And so saliva we use to digest our food um, and theirs is very special. So they inject that venom into their food and then that venom actually starts to digest the bug on the inside, kind of making a, a cricket slurry or smoothie, we'll call it. And then she goes and she kind of sucks out the juices on the inside and then she leaves behind the kind of the husk the outer shell of that insect. Kind of gross, huh? But works for them. They don't have huge mouth parts. They mostly have big, big, big fangs though. So she is a spider. What makes her a spider? Does anybody know how many, what makes a spider a spider? What do they have on their body that makes them a spider? Any guesses? Um, eight legs, Logan. Nice, Rachel, Logan. kids. Absolutely. Well, Sarah, let's. Aurora. I'm gonna move oh, this up. More. <laughs> yeah. Let's see how many legs you guys count. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um. Wait a minute. Well, she does have eight legs, but if you look at the front, kind of hard. It's very difficult. She's in an <laughs> odd position. She's got these two legs. Not really legs. They're not called legs. In the front of her body. They're kind of like, I like to think of them as kind of like antenna. So she uses those to kind of feel her, the world and feel around with them. They're called pedipalps is the fancy word. So she does have eight legs, right? Absolutely. Anything else? If you look at her, she has two body parts. She's got a head and then she's got an abdomen. So yeah, that's job, Tucker. And oh, Abby. nice, Tucker, got body it. Parts. All right, I'm gonna put Gwen away. She's getting pretty active. Uh, so a couple of questions while you're um, yeah. while you're putting her away. We had um, a couple of questions of asking, could she hurt you or why isn't she biting you? Absolutely. Good questions, guys. So she is a Chilean rose tarantula, and they're kind of known for being pretty docile and pretty chill because she's got some pretty good ways of protecting herself. She's got those hairs. She's got those big fangs. So she's like, yeah, she's not worried about too much in the world. So they tend to be pretty chill. So she's, and we, has also been, we have also been handling her a lot. So she's used to people and used to being handled. So she doesn't see us as a threat. And that's why I was very gentle with her and went very slow with her. I don't want her to see me as a threat. So, um, so she's pretty cool with us. She doesn't want to hurt us. What was the other question? I think I made a miss part of it. <laughs> um, no, that was it. It was basically okay. like, could she hurt you and why is it right. she biting you? And um, she, if she did bite me, it would, it's going to hurt. I'm not going to lie because she's got big fangs, but it's not going to harm me. It's not going to kill me because her venom is not very strong. It's not very potent. It's kind of like they, they say it's probably like being stung by a bee. Now, if you're allergic to bees, you might have some issues, but for the most part, it doesn't, it's not going to hurt her. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, so all lots right. of questions. Goodness, you um, guys are all over this. So, um, Leslie and Brad um, asked how old she is. Um. And then Jordan <laughs> asked what her lifespan is. Oh, so she's five years old? Mm -hmm. All right. Are you sure? 
That's what I was told. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why 13 jumped in my head, but that might have been a previous spiders we had. So five years old. And this is where it's good. It pays to be a girl in the tarantula world. Sorry, guys. But the girls can live anywhere from 10 to 20 years old. The boys, more like three to five. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> so it's good to be a girl. All right. So we're going to move on to our next story. So we met a Native American, so that's here in North America. We're gonna to go to the other side of the world, to Greece, to Greeks. And they had some pretty crazy stories. The Greek mythology, I loved reading Greek mythology when I was a kid. Did any of you guys read Greek mythology? Or read it, you guys are kids, some of them you are. <laughs> Anybody like Greek mythology? Let me ask you this, those that have read it, who is the god of the gods, the head honcho, top god, big man on campus, whatever you want to call him. So he was kind of the king of the gods. Does anybody right. know his name? Yeah, we got lots of people. Nice. Nina, Anika, Whoa. Logan, Tucker, the Five Fighters, Chris, Leslie, Wolf, Maddox, Allison, Abby, Lee, Liz, Grayson, and so many more say wow. Zeus. Nice job. <laughs> Zeus, right, absolutely. And he had a wife, his name was Hera. And so in a lot of these, these Greek stories about the constellations, you're gonna meet some of these characters throughout them. And our next story is about, I'll go back to, um, you guys remember that first picture I showed with the Big Dipper, okay, on it? Well, how many of you guys knew that the Big Dipper was actually just a small part of a whole constellation called Ursa Major? Let's see if, yeah. yeah, a lot of people. Right. Amanda. So what is uh, what is Ursa? Does anybody know what that means? What animal is that? There's the picture of it. Amanda. The bear. Yeah. Right. Logan. Hero. Brian. Nice. Holden. Anderson. Andrea. M. <laughs> Davis. Wesley and Lily. Nice job, guys. You are on it. Right. Lots so Ursa people. means bear. Absolutely. So Ursa Major, big bear or big dipper, and then Ursa Minor is little bear, and so. Oh, let's go back to that picture. <laughs> Sorry, Beth. <laughs> if you look at that picture, what, that bear looks a little funny. What do you notice that's kind of wrong with the bear? Does he look a little odd? <laughs> Tail, lots of people, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anika Allison, yeah. Macy, poor Casey girl. Are Nathaniel, bears supposed to have long tails? Tegan. <laughs> no, you're right. So he looks Landon very funny. Ruddy. He's got a long tail. That's very odd to see. So, all right, Beth, we could go by with that. Thank you. So, yeah, so that, there's actually a story about why they have such a long tail up in the sky. And it goes back to that Zeus. So, Zeus, he was kind of the, like I said, he was the king. He, um, he kind of liked the ladies, <laughs> to say. And he didn't always make great decisions, even though he was married to Hera. And so one day, Zeus came down to the earth. And he ran into Callisto, and she was a beautiful maiden, and they fell in love, even though he was married. <laughs> and they had a child, and his name was Arcus. Well, one day Hera, of course, heard about this, and as you can imagine, she probably wasn't very happy about it. She was not happy at all. And so she stormed to the earth, and she found Callisto, and she turned Callisto into a bear big bear and Callisto was so scared of Hera that she took off into the woods and she hid into those woods for years and while she was out there in the woods her son Arcus grew up he grew up to be a young man and a very good hunter and so one day he was out in the woods and he was hunting and he came across this very large bear and of course he had no idea that it was his mom and so he just saw a big, scary bear. If you can imagine if you saw a chief coming at you like that, <laughs> you'd want to defend yourself, right? So he took out his bow and arrow and he was just about to shoot his mom. And Zeus saw this and he stepped in and he turned Argus into a little bear, <laughs> to another bear. But he didn't feel that they were quite safe enough. So he grabbed them both by their tails her short little stubby tails, and he dragged them up into the sky and placed them up in the sky. 
and that of course stretched out their tails and that's why they have long tails up in the sky. And so he further protected them, but Hera heard that he had done that and she was angry and she's like, I will get my revenge. I will get it. So she went to her friend Poseidon, the god of the sea, and she said, do not let those bears come down to drink or bathe. They can't come near the water. I don't want them touching the water. So that's why the Big Dipper and Little Dipper are always up in the sky and they never come down to the horizon. They're always up and you get to see them all year round. And I think, like I think to say, like Hera gave us um, thirsty, stinky bears up in the sky now. <laughs> so, so that, thanks Hera. <laughs> so, the big bear, little bear. Canis, or excuse me, not Canis, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. So does anybody want to guess what they think this big one is? What bear do you think this is? It's pretty good size compared to this guy. Oops, get my hands out of the way. We're getting see. black. Polar, so yeah, we got, good job, Nathaniel Polar Bear. Yeah, well, you're close. At, not quite as big as a polar oh, bear. Oh, oh, sorry, I was wrong. That was me, <laughs> not you guys, sorry. It's a good guess, though, because this is pretty big. It's almost as big as a polar um, bear. Chris says brown grizzly. Nice job. Uh, said brown this, bear, good right. job. This is the brown bear. You all bear. are smarter than me. <laughs> so brown bear, and, it's, and their scientific name, Ursus Arctos. So Ursus is Latin for bear. Arctos is Greek for bear. So basically he's a bear bear. <laughs> it's kind of silly. And then of course, I heard some of you guys say <laughs> their smaller one, his name is Ursus Americanus. So the bear, American yeah, bear. Yeah, says black bear. Nice job. For Casey girls, good nice job. job. And I don't know if, you, I, I feel bad that you guys can't feel this, but I have some black bear fur over here. And I could just sit here and pet this all day. <laughs> I wish we had feel a vision. That would have been kind of cool. <laughs> all right. So that is what am I doing next? Oh, I forget. Okay. All right, Miss Beth, if you could put up our next constellation. I don't know if you guys, anybody here um, Harry Potter fans? Anybody get any yeses? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I Lots of yeses. Yay, excellent, <laughs> me too. So you're gonna notice in this lot of the stars, you're gonna see some familiar names like our next constellation, Draco. You guys remember that from Harry Potter? So he, Draco actually means dragon in Greek, or not, excuse me, not Greek, in Latin, <laughs> means dragon. So this is a pretty long, a big constellation. I think it's the eighth largest constellation out there. And it's up in the Northern part of the world. And let's see, this goes back to, let's see if I can get my props in. <laughs> done. Okay, Beth, you can come back to me. We're gonna tell the story of Draco, the dragon in the sky. So this goes back to Hera. So Hera was Zeus's wife. So when Zeus and Hera got married, they were given a wedding present. Somebody said, here, here's a seed. It was probably like, I'm the queen of the gods. Thanks, <laughs> really? But she knew better. She went and planted that seed in her garden and it grew into a big, beautiful apple tree. And you might think, um, apple tree? I'm like, thanks. No ordinary apples grew in that tree. They were golden apples. So pure gold apples grew from that tree. Now it's a tree worthy of a queen, right? So that beautiful apple tree grew these beautiful golden apples and Hera knew people probably don't want to steal my apples because everybody wants gold right so she grew that so her garden was actually on an island far away that nobody knew where it was except for the major gods and she wanted to further protect it and she asked Atlas to see if her his daughters would would go there the Hesperides would stay on that island and protect those golden apples but she wasn't done there she wanted further protection. So she needed another alarm system. And so she asked her friend Layden, the 100 headed dragon, to go and protect those apples. And so Layden wrapped himself around that tree and he protected those apples. And those apples were safe for a long time until someone came across. You guys might have heard of them. How many of you guys have heard of Hercules? I like to say, Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people, yes. 
so Hercules had a lot of tasks he had to do because he wanted to be immortal. He wanted to live forever. And so one of those tasks was he had to steal one of those apples. So first he had to find the island. Then he had to get through the Hesperides, which were nymphs, which, you know, for Hercules, not a problem. And then he had to go and battle a hundred headed dragon. And so he took his sword and his sword, <laughs> his sword, and he fought that dragon. And every time he cut off one of the heads, another one grew in his place. And so this battle went on for a long time and he just wasn't winning because there were just so many heads. But then he remembered, oh, I have a poison arrow. So he drew back his bow and he shot Leyden with his poison arrow and it worked. And he was able to get the golden apple and continue on his way. Hera heard about poor Leyden and she was heartbroken. And so to memorialize him, to, so she could see him forever and be able to look at them all the time, he placed, she placed Leyden up in the stars and she wrapped it around the North Pole, that North Star up there. So she's always up in the sky and she'll always be able to see it. So that's why we have a dragon in the sky. Uh, so Carrie and Michael said, Carrie said this is her favorite myth and Michael says he just, he loves this story. Oh, cool. Yay. That's awesome. And some, and Anika said she learned this in, in my class. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And you'll find out there, I mean, there's so many, because they were telling these stories before they wrote things down. So the stories are different and my version is probably different than somebody else's version. And we tend to embellish when we tell stories. So <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, they, a lot awesome. of people love that story. Yay. Brandon Alicia, Nathaniel. All right. So I don't really have a true dragon. <laughs> I have one that. Well, I'm gonna calm down. There we go. Now he's not gonna breathe fire, and he doesn't have a hundred heads, <laughs> but he's still pretty cool. He's dragon esque, dragonish. <laughs> So this is, who did we get, Cyprus today? Uh, yes, Cyprus. Yeah. Yep, so this is Cyprus. Does anybody know what kind of uh, <clears throat> dragon he is? <laughs> yeah, some people say saltwater croc, croc or alligator, gator. Nice. Good alligator, guesses. alligator, alligator. There you lizard, go. Lizard, baby Komodo. <laughs> oh, I wish we could have gotten I'm our baby Komodo. Gator, so. Yeah. Right, this is your American alligator, absolutely. So not a dragon, but that's all right. He's still pretty cool, isn't he? Oh, Sarah and Shannon said specifically American alligator. Nice yeah. job. Nice job. Education specialist. Nice job, guys. So right, so this is your American alligator, and this is a, a baby one, a young one. And we'll see, if I can get a little bit closer. I think he's pretty cool. I think he's got really cool eyes. They have beautiful eyes. Let me zoom in on him. <laughs> so he is kind of on the smallish side so he's our animal ambassador and i don't know if you know alligators can get pretty big but when they start off they're pretty small and if you look he's got all these really cool kind of stripes on his body you see all those because if you can imagine he's going to be living in the water and there's a lot of different reflections and refractions and circles kind of on the water and when the sun's reflecting on it and it kind of those little, excuse me those stripes kind of break it up and so it helps them to do something in the water does anybody know what that stripes and all those colorations what it would help him do what's that fancy word for oh you? yep camouflage nice Alice, job Sela, Ursula, leslie Wendy, Grace, and Gloria, Andrea, Holden, Nika, Aurora, Tara, Kim. A lot of smart kids out there. Nice job. Nice job. Long prep. Great Absolutely. Energy. Good camouflage. So it helps them blend in. And another really good camouflage is they look like statues. So they don't move. So they're what we call ambush predators. So they basically they sit and they don't move and they wait for food to come to them. So he'll hide under the water. And only thing sticking out are those eyes and the nose. So that way he can see and of course he can breathe while he's waiting for food to come in. And he doesn't move. A lot of people see our alligators here at the zoo and they think they're not real or they're not alive, <laughs> but they are. That's just what they do is they just sit and wait for food to come to them. Yes, we have a question. 
Uh, yeah, so Nathaniel and Brad wanted mm -hmm. to know how old Cypress is. And that, well, was, that was another question. Somebody asked their name. So Cypress. Cypress is his name. <laughs> yep. So Cypress. Ethan. <laughs> we're guessing, is he what, two, three years old? Somewhere in there? Somewhere in there, yeah. We're guessing. We're not 100% sure. So we got Cypress because somebody had him and his, his roommate, Bayou, um, as pets. And we don't think they were taking really great care of them because we're not sure if they weren't being fed right or if they just weren't in a proper housing or taken care of very well. Because when we got them, they were tiny. So they were probably about, when we got them, oops, sorry, buddy, you were nice and comfortable. <laughs> I just interrupted it. Oops, let me see if I get him comfortable again. All right, apparently he likes that one position. There we go. There we go, bud. You're fine. <laughs> or not. <laughs> so he just takes a minute to relax and let him relax. So I was trying to point out, so when we got him, he was probably about his full from nose to tail was about from his nose to the base of his tail. So about here from his nose to there was about what they came in that size. So they were super tiny and they were about a year or two old, which was really, really tiny. So in the wild, they'd be a lot bigger. So they would probably be at two to three years old in the wild, they would probably be probably two or three times the size. So they were really, really, really small. So we're not sure what, why or what happened, but we got them and I'm telling you, since we got them, he is like double, almost triple in size since we've gotten them. And we'll only have them for a short period of time because there's going to be to a point where they're going to get so big that it's not going to be, it's going to be harder to handle them and it's not going to be safe to handle them because they have all those little sharp teeth. Right now they're tiny, but those little teeth are going to get bigger and bigger. And we actually have a question that kind of goes with that. So Holden wanted to know how big they get. Ah. And I think somebody else had that too. Nice. Yeah, Addison. Right. So they can get up to... What's the max? 12, 10, yeah. 12 feet, somewhere in there. We have a, a gator, our big gator. We are gator boy. He's about 10 feet and he's about, is he about three to 500 pounds or something in there. So they can get pretty big. Boys bigger than girls. So we're not sure exactly if, so when he gets to a certain point, we've already got a location, a home for him picked out where he, they can go and live out their lives and grow as big as they want. Um, so that's why we took them in. We made sure we had somewhere at one point when they were too big for us to use as ambassadors that they would have a place to go and live out their lives. So yeah, so we've already got that point, that, that place already picked out for him. So he can grow and he might be able to get up to 10, 12 feet. We'll never know. <laughs> uh, a couple other questions for yeah. you. So we have a lot of people wanted to know this one. Liz, uh, Silpa, um, Holden. A lot of other, a lot of people wanted to know what they eat. Oh, let me ask you guys. What do you think? Did they, are they plant eaters or are they meat eaters? Or that fancy science word, are they carnivores or meat eaters or are they plant eaters or herbivores? Meat, good job right, everybody. Right, they are. So they'll pretty much eat anything that crosses their path. That's, you know, kind of small. They can take, take something down. So if there's a large gator, he can easily take down a deer. They can grab it. He can lunge out and grab it with his powerful jaws. And then if it's too big, what they'll do is they'll actually drag it under the water and kind of stuff it under the water and let it kind of break down a little bit. And then that way they can go down and have a little bite here and there because they can't chew their food. So they have to take one bite and then kind of swallow it whole. So they can't do, they can't swallow whole deer at once. So they have to let the water kind of help break it down before they can kind of eat it and take chunks of it at a time. So they'll eat a lot of different things. So we feed, what do we feed him? He gets probably- uh, Chicken. Chicken and probably- Did fish. we feed him mice, fish? Mice. Yeah, some meat products and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. gets a variety of different food like they would in the wild. Uh, my favorite thing is as they're hiding, I don't know, I'll see if we can get up close again. On this lower jaw, <laughs> he's like, what is that microphone? <laughs> he's looking at it going what is that oh that's pretty so there's these little dots kind of on their lower jaw and or in upper jaw too so as he's sitting in the water waiting for food to come to him if a fish swims by it sends out vibrations in the water so as it's moving and those vibrations hit his jaw and they're very sensitive 
they have a lot of nerve endings there. And so he can feel those vibrations and then that way he can sense that there's an animal nearby. So pretty cool way of being able to sense his world. All right, I'm gonna put Cypress back. Uh, so a quick question, question to yeah. that if we could ask, we have so many questions. I wish we could answer them all, everybody. Um, but one- Luckily we was, have a team of very smart people. Yeah, <laughs> one is so. from Ashley uh, Hardison. She said, how do you tell the difference between an alligator and a crocodile? Oh, very good question. Let me get my, my hand sanitizer. So, lucky for you, I have a lovely answer. So this is a replica, not a real, kind of a model of an alligator jaw. And if you notice, the end of the nose is very U-shaped. Let's see, I'll hold it like that. You see that? So it's U-shaped. A crocodile's, theirs are more kind of V-shaped, so more pointed at the end. And if you wanna get close enough to look at this, you can look at the teeth, but that means you'd have to get pretty close. So in an alligator, this tooth right here, this fourth tooth, it fits nicely in the upper jaw and you can't see it. In a crocodile, it would stick up and you'd see it like that. But that means you have to get pretty close to that fourth tooth to see it. So go by the nose shape. <laughs> That's the safest way to do it. So let's see. Um, another really cool thing about alligators, when you saw a cypress, he was kind of bumpy, had a bunch of ridges and stuff on him. Under those ridges, there's this really cool, <laughs> there we go. So bone called an osteoderm. Osteo means bone, derm means skin. So bone skin. So under those ridges, he's got these cool bones. So why would he think he would want bones under skin like that? All those little bones, all those ridges you see on the top of an alligator. What are those doing for the alligator? What do you guys think? Chrissy says protection. Nice, yeah. Kind of like an Siobhan armor. Siobhan says protection. Rachel protect them. The five fighters to protect nice. them. Good five fighters. That's yes. kind of cool. <laughs> armor. Right. Great armor. Yeah. yeah. Right. Here's another thing. If you notice all those little holes on there, there's a lot of holes kind of going through that. I know it's hard to see. I don't know if you guys can see it very well. But blood vessels actually go into that. So as alligators are sitting out in the sun during the daytime, because they're what we call cold blood is, is the non-scientific non term. <laughs> and so that means they have to get their body temperature from the air around them. So they have to sit in the sun to get warm. And so as they're sitting in the sun, their body's getting warm, those blood vessels are getting warm and absorbing heat. And then at night when it's colder, those are kind of holding on to it. So they're kind of like solar panels, I like to think of them. So they're holding on to the heat and then releasing that heat at night when it's cooler. So it keeps them warm at night. Pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what people right. said that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see. What's my next story? Oh, oh. All right, I've never done this virtually. <sighs> let's see if we can do it. All right. I need everybody out there to stand up. Okay, you guys are going to help me out with this program, this one, all right? Okay, let's see. Let me get my props. Here we go. All right. So, Miss Beth, if you can show us our next constellation. <laughs> We're going to meet Canis Major and Canis Minor. So big dog, little dog is this next story. And so there, and there's, I look this, this picture. You guys remember Sirius, Harry Potter? So he's in the Canis Major constellation. So that's the brightest star actually out there. So pretty cool. So there's a Harry Potter reference. Okay. All right. Come on back to me, Beth. <laughs> so all you guys out there, um, I want you to pick a seat side of the screen. So if you're over, if there's more of you in, in front of the camera, split off. So you're each on one half of the screen. If there's just one of you, just pick a side. So you're either going to be on this side or this side of the screen, okay? You guys can see me. So if you're over here, over here, I'm going to split you guys off. I don't want to do this for the group. <laughs> so let's see if this is going to work. All right. And when I point to you, I'm going to, you guys, I'm going to turn you guys into a different animal. So this side is going to be one animal, this side is going to be another animal, okay? And when I point to your animal, you're going to run in place. All right, so we're going to get some exercise. You guys ready to help me tell the story? All right, this is the story of Lelaps, the dog. So all my friends over here, you guys are the dog Lelaps. 
oh, sorry. <laughs> it's hard to tell where it is. There we go. And then all my friends on this side of the screen, you guys are going to be my fox. All right. So we're going back to the Greeks. So Lee Laps was a dog and he was so fast that he caught everything he chased. He always caught everything. So as you imagine, he was a pretty popular dog. A lot of the kings and queens wanted him. And so it's for hunting, so of course, because he caught everything and he could bring back food to them. And so one king, Cephas, inherited Lelaps. And Cephas had heard about this fox. And he was running around. He was the fastest fox. And he was running around. Nobody could catch him. And he was kind of ravaging the countryside. He was terrorizing people, scaring people. And so Cephas wanted Lelaps to chase the fox because he could always ch catch everything he chased. But the fox was never to be caught. He was so fast he could not be caught. So you can imagine what's gonna happen here. This is gonna be quite the chase, guys. So, Lee Laps found the fox, the fox saw him, and they started to chase. So my foxes start running in place. Go, 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 ready? All right, dogs, all right, Lee Laps, run, 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 couldn't quite catch him. All right, Whew. I'm winded, you guys. Take a break. Okay, all right. Oh, well, they weren't done. Because that went on for days. Oh my God, they were running for days. Ah. So they took a break. Oh, take a breather. All right, you guys ready? I'm gonna do another chase. Ready, my foxes. Get go, 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 Okay, my dogs, go, 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 chasing, 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 almost got him. Nope, he got away. <laughs> Last second. Oh, this went on for weeks this chasing and stopping and going, and they were exhausted. Whew, they're like, oh my goodness, we're so tired. I don't know you, I'm tired, I'm winded. <laughs> of course, I'm old and out of shape, so <laughs> you guys are probably fine. So they were exhausted. Well, Zeus saw this going on, this is going on for months, and he felt sorry for them, because this was never gonna end. It's gonna go on forever. So he turned them into stones, and he put them up in the sky, and that's why we have Canis Major. Canis minor. So your big dog, little dog up in the sky. All right. <laughs> so thank you guys. Hope you guys got some exercise. <laughs> I know I did. Ooh, I need to drink water after that one. Which actually brings me to my last story. Okay. Let's see. Um, Beth, if you wouldn't mind putting up our next photo for us, our next constellation. It's actually three animals. I can't count three animals. So it's our longest constellation. And I'm thinking you guys can figure out what Hydra is. What kind of animal is Hydra? <laughs> Anika, snake. Nice, right? Yeah, Carrie, Tucker, and Gabby, Holden, Andrea. All right, right. And Michael. <laughs> Hydra is the big snake. 57 vet. Holden. Nice job, guys. So, right, so that's our snake. And you'll notice in the picture, there's actually two other constellations with it. There's the crater, which is a cup. And then there's a crow, Corvus, the crow. Oh, one says Corvus. There you go. Good. Yeah. Good. Nice, Nathaniel. Nice job. And so there's actually a story about all three of those. So, all right, Beth, you can come back to me. Okay. This is that. This goes to Apollo. So we're going to meet another god. So Apollo was the god of medicine, poetry, music, and all that stuff. So... He was out, I don't know, reciting poetry all day. <laughs> I don't know what, what, what gods do, gods poetry do. And he got a little parched, a little thirsty, because he was, you know, reciting all that poetry. And so he said, he saw his friend Corvus, the crow, nearby. And he said, Corvus, would you please fill out my cup? And for some reason, it has a name, Crater. <laughs> crater for me. And go to the stream and fill this cup up. I am thirsty. So Corvus said, of course. I got it, no problem. So he flew off, and as he was flying over to the river, he saw a fig tree. And Corvus, it's his favorite food. He loves figs. Best food ever for him. <laughs> Anyways, and so he went to this, oh, he's, oh, I'm gonna go have some figs. So he went to the tree, and he saw these figs. They weren't quite ripe. They were just about ripe. And so, okay, I'll wait, because, oh my God, I really, really want a fig. So he sat there and he waited 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 
and bing, that fig ripened up and it was perfectly plump and juicy. And he grabbed that fig and he ate it. Oh my, it's the best tasting fig ever. And it was so good, so worth the wait. But then he realized, uh-oh, I sat here for two days. I didn't get a pile of his water. I'm in trouble. So he flew off with a cup and went to the river and he got there and he was like, oh, I gotta come up with a story. What am I gonna tell him? Oh no, I'm gonna be in so much trouble. I'm gonna be in trouble. Oh no, what am I gonna do? And he spied Hydra, the snake, sitting nearby. And he's like, I'm gonna blame it on the snake. So he grabbed Hydra, the cup, and he flew back to Apollo and he set them both down in front of Apollo. He said, the team made you do it. He kept me away from the water for days. He just kept striking and yelling. He wouldn't let me near the water. I couldn't get there. And of course, Apollo knew he was lying. And because he lied to him, he was very, very angry. And so for some reason, the Greek gods like to do this. They <laughs> grabbed all three of them and he threw them up in the sky. And that's why we have Hydra, Corvus, and the crater all together up there in the sky <laughs> together. So those crazy Greeks, they had some pretty good stories. And I always feel sad for poor Hydra doing nothing wrong, just hanging out, did nothing wrong. And that's kind of similar to what um, snakes today are. <laughs> I feel like they get misunderstood. Hi, buddy. <laughs> They're very misunderstood. A lot of people think bad things about them, but they're pretty awesome. <laughs> this, let's see if you'll come up and say hi. This is King Tut. Go around this way, buddy. Oh, <laughs> he's, he's camera shy today, apparently. Here he comes. There you go. So this is King Tut. And does anybody want to try and guess what kind of snake you think he is? He's a snake we can find here in North Carolina. James Oops. says pine snake. Good guess. Um, L-A-K says, where did it go? Milk snake. Good guess. Allison, Good. Grayson, uh, Sela or Sela, Macy. Chrissy Nicole Eakin or Chrissy Nicole. Okay, the, uh, I said king snake. Nice okay. job. You're right. He is a king snake. He's an eastern king snake. And king snakes are got their name king snake for a reason. Does anybody know why they're called king snakes? Let's see if anybody can figure that. You guys have been pretty smart. You guys are know your stuff. I've been impressed with you guys. You know why? It has to do with what know. they eat. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. No. Oh, it has to do with what they eat. Uh, some people are saying that they think it's because they're big. Well, they can be. These are kind of a big-ish snake. There are bigger snakes in North Carolina. All right. Michael and Chrissy said because they can eat other snakes and venomous. Snakes. Nice. Perfect. That's awesome. Right. So, yeah. So, they eat other snakes and they eat venomous snakes. And so that kind of makes them the kings of the snakes, right? So if you eat everything and you eat other snakes, you're pretty, pretty kingly. He's pretty awesome, isn't he? So, like I said, King Tut, <laughs> that's what you guys name. They're beautiful snakes. Like I said, they're found around here. You can find king snakes in North Carolina. And they have these nice spots and all those different stripes on them to help them do what? What's that fancy word for when you want to hide? There you go. Nice job. Right. So snakes are very misunderstood. So he is not venomous. He will not hurt me because um, he's not venomous at all. And so he's off. A lot of people think of snakes as being kind of not nice or not very friendly, but he's pretty cool, isn't he? So they're very misunderstood. A lot of think of they're all they're just poisonous. And all of them are poisonous or venomous. And yeah, no, that's definitely not the case. Very few. We only have actually six venomous snakes here in North Carolina. Of the 30 some odd that we have, only six of them are venomous. So chances are any snake you're going to run to, most of them are going to be non-venomous. Yes. like. Uh, so we have a lot of questions. All right. To make sure we get some of these questions in. So K5 <laughs> spe uh, education specialist asks, do snakes have ears? Oh, good question. Well, let's look. 
Do you guys see any? Can you see any ears, ear holes? Can anybody see any ears? No, they're saying, no, no. I don't see any. No, it's because he doesn't have any. So no ears. But they hear in a different way. So they hear with their jaw, kind of like the alligator does. He feels vibrations in his jaw. Same with the snake. So he can feel the vibrations. So if you're stomping around on the ground, you're sending vibrations to the ground and their snake is picking those up in his jaw and he can tell that you're nearby. And so he might go away and he'll leave. So, cause they don't really want to be around people to be honest with you. Good question. So no, no ears. My next question for you, if you got into a staring contest with a snake, who's gonna win? Would you win? Or would the snake win? Cook family snake. You're yes, right. Sarah Landon. Absolutely. Rachel why is that? Beth. Well, why would you win? Or why would the snake win? What do you guys think? Why would the snake win a staring on oh, this? Oh, a lot of people know. Good job. Nice. Gloria, Logan, Chris, Henry, they don't have eyelids. Nice job. Yeah. Absolutely. No eyelids, which means no blinking. <laughs> so even when a snake is sleeping, their eyes are open. I think that's probably why people find them a little bit creepy and a little bit off-putting too, because their eyes are always open whether they're sleeping or not, which is a little bit creepy. But that's just the way they are. But they do have a really kind of cool, uh oh, I'm wrapped up. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it wraps on one hand and it's fine. Oh, there we go. I gotcha. Support you. They actually have a scale that goes over their eye. Let's see. How's that looking, Leslie? Can you see it? So they have a scale that goes over their eye, and you can see it. So when they shed their skin, they actually shed that scale too. So that's kind of like, uh, I like to think of it as like a contact lens that protects their eye. So it goes over their eye and protects it. So that's why, <laughs> and it keeps their eye from drying out too. Cause like, if you imagine if you kept your eyes open, your eyes would eventually dry out and that wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, Any other questions? questions? Okay. Yeah, yeah oh, we'll we take them. Of questions, so. ah, yes. <laughs> Jordan wants to know how old is he and how long? Oh goodness. I'm guessing he's probably about Three and a half feet, be my guess. I'm not 100 sure. Do you know how old he is, Leslie? I can't I think don't of the top of my head. In my head, I'm not sure exactly how old he is. Maybe one of our our Beth Bolta says 21. Nice, thank you, Beth. <laughs> I forgot to read up on. Beth's our one. director. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I have a team of smart people behind me. <laughs> this is awesome. Right. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um. So Finn Chaser asked, we have rat snakes in our chicken coop. Can uh -huh. I pick them up? Um, I don't suggest it just because, you know, anything with a mouth can bite and they're going to bite if they feel threatened. Chances are they'll, they don't want to be near you, but if you back them in a corner and try and pick them up, that's usually when people get bit by snakes. So I wouldn't, if you, if you, unless you do it, um, well, you can call somebody to remove them. Um, there's a lot of snake removal places. Um, one of our uh, our, keep, our, keep ex, our retired keepers actually has a snake removal business too, so which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so call someone that's professional, um, just in case sometimes, I don't want anybody getting hurt. So it's best not to pick up wild snakes because they're just trying to protect themselves. And so you might get accidentally hurt, not only by getting hurt. So along with that, um, Aurora asked if it's snake, if it's safe to have snakes as pets. Yeah, sure. It depends on the, the snake. <laughs> I don't advise getting venomous snakes as pets, <laughs> but um, I know a lot of people have corn snakes as pets, and they're pretty pretty chill. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it's depends on the snake you have, and a lot of times it's if you get them young and you just handle them a lot, and they're used to being handled, you don't have any issues. Kind of like King Tut here; he's been around people, around people his whole life, so he's pretty chill. Good questions, guys. Any other questions? Um, we do. We don't have a lot of time left, okay. though. But right, we'll take one more question. Um, we did have a, a bunch of people did ask. Um, well, let's do how long do they live, and um, how do they use their tongues to smell? Oh, good questions. So, depending on this particular snake, I want to say probably twenty so years um, in the wild, twenty to thirty, but because he's in human care. He has free food. He's got free vet care. He actually gets acupuncture. 
our vets actually do acupuncture on him because he's had some he's had some health issues in the past and so we have vets here to take care of him so he's going to live longer than that those years and that tongue question good question so you can see him sticking his tongue out he's not being rude he's just sensing the world around him so that's what he uses to kind of smell or taste so he's sticking out his tongue and it's forked and so he sticks that tongue out and he's collecting odor particles in the air and they attach to his tongue and then he brings it in and he puts it into an organ on the roof of his mouth called the Jacobson's organ and it tells him what he's smelling but the forked tongue is for a reason so just like you guys have ears on one side of your each side of your head so you can hear in direction this is how they smell in direction so if a mouse is over on here those mouse particles are going to collect on this side of his tongue and he's going to know ooh, mouse that way i'm going to go that way so they smell in direction just kind of cool all right i'm going to put king tut back so thank you king tut you rock such a good boy I was a nice warm tree for him <laughs> so he doesn't want to get off. All right, get some hand sanitizer because it's always a good idea anytime you handle any kind of animal. Clean yourself up. Nowadays, everything you touch. So, all right, so my last part. So we learned a lot about stars. And stars are very important to us. They help us out in a lot of different ways and animals too. And so there's something out there. I want to see what you guys, how, if you guys have ever heard of this. So if you have heard of this, say yes. If you have not, say no. And I'm not quizzing. I'm not looking to see who's right or wrong. I'm just seeing if anybody's ever heard of this. How many of you guys have heard of something called light pollution? Has anybody heard of light pollution? Yep. A lot of people know. Oh, some knows. Some knows, yeah. Which is fine, yeah. Um, no, that's great. That's fine. Most I get usually get more no's. Very few people have heard of it. So Miss Beth, if you will show our last slide. So you don't usually think of light as being a pollution, right? And affecting things, affecting our world. If you look at this picture, it's pretty cool. So there's a before and an after. So before is this house and all the town's lights are on, the street lights are on, the house lights are on, all the different lights that we use at night are on. And if you notice, you don't see a lot of stars. They're kind of hazy. You don't really see them very well. Well, the after is the same house when there was a power outage. So the whole town was black. There was no lights. Look at all the stars. So those were the stars that were there, but because all those lights were on, they were blocking the stars. And if you can imagine, that's going to have an impact on lots of different animals because they're gonna not know what's, if it's daytime, if it's nighttime. So a lot of your nocturnal or nighttime animals, they won't know where to go. <laughs> it's kind of dark. All right, Beth, we can come back to me. So they are they're kind of confused. They don't know what to do. So that light pollution is actually affecting their, their ability to possibly have babies. It's even affecting sea turtles. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. So sea turtles, they, when they hatch and they come out of the sand, they have an instinct to look to the brightest part, which is usually the moon and the stars reflecting on the ocean. And it brights as a nice bright horizon line. And they have the instinct to go to that. And unfortunately, a lot of people, well, not unfortunately, a lot of people like to live by the beach because it's beautiful there. And so a lot of houses have their lights on and a lot of towns have their lights on and it's super bright. So when that turtle comes out, he's gonna go to the brightest part. So he's gonna go towards town and not the ocean. And so luckily people care enough and they decided that, you know, a lot of people care about those turtles. And so they have laws that they have to turn out lights or keep some, a lot of the lights off during certain times of year when they know the turtles are hatching. So it's kind yeah, of cool. Yeah, Shannon so says we have to leave the lights off at night in the Oh, banks. cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice job. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's something they can do to combat light pollution. And you know, they waste energy too. There's other different ways you can do light pollution because like I said, a lot of those animals Birds can't, you know, if they're flying and they're using those stars to navigate, find their way at night, and there's all of a sudden they come across a big city, they can go off course. And, and, and then they waste a lot of energy trying to get back to where they are. They need to go. So a lot of cool things we can do to help animals and ourselves too, believe it or not. 
So I think you should have been sent it and it will also be on our website. There's some really cool owl pledges you guys can take. It says, owl pledge to only use lights when needed, right? So when you leave a room, turn off the lights, guys. Simple, easy thing everybody can do. I will pledge to spread the word about light pollution. So now that you know a little bit more about it, or you can learn more about it too, and you can tell your friends, those people that didn't know about it, haven't ever heard about it. Or you can, I will pledge, simple, another easy one. When you have your lights on inside the house, and so it doesn't go outside, close your blinds or curtains, like that. Simple, easy thing you can do. Or you can become a citizen science. Especially nowadays that you guys are stuck at home. <laughs> a lot of our stuff, you can do this at home. You can go to this website, globeatnight.org, and you can download an app and you can kind of help scientists figure where light pollution is and where it's not. And it's a really cool app you can do. And you can learn more about light pollution there at their website too. So a lot of cool stuff that you guys can do at home, easy things to help prevent light pollution. All right, guys. I wanna thank you guys so much for joining us for Animal Stars. I hope you heard some fun stories, maybe learned a few things, and we'll hope to see you at our next zoo classroom. All right guys, take care and stay safe.